Hi, I'm Mr. Jack. I'm the principal here at Greenfield Central Junior High School, and welcome. We're a building of 7th and 8th graders, around 700 students, and we are excited to have MacBooks one-to-one -one next year. We also offer Algebra 1, Geometry, Biology 1, all for high school credit. We have a strings violin class for 7th and 8th graders, in addition to band, choir, family consumer sciences, technology, and all the other core classes that you can think of. In today's segment, we're going to meet Mrs. San Giorgio, who is a social studies teacher, and Miss San Giorgio, our English teacher. Glad to have you here. Hello, I'm Capranson, and I'm here with Mrs. Uh, San Giorgio. Uh, how are you doing this morning? Doing well, doing well. And you are a teacher here at the uh, junior high. Uh, what do you teach? I teach eighth grade U.S. history. Okay, and uh, what are some of the main values that you uh, try to get to your students as a teacher? Um, well, through U.S. history, we talk about a lot of different leaders, so we focus on leadership skills, mm -hmm. the way people that led our country served as really good examples for Americans and people becoming U.S. citizens and things mm -hmm. like that. So lots of different principles. Mm -hmm. And uh, the junior high is actually getting MacBooks next year, much yes. like the high school. What do you plan to incorporate with the MacBooks in your classroom? Well, actually we're in a lab today, so our kids are pretty familiar with working on computers and using different digital technology, but we're all getting very prepared to do Google Classroom as our platform and essentially do everything we do on paper and with pencils on the computers next year. We already do all of our tests and quizzes on computers mm -hmm. and we're going to incorporate a lot of more day in, day out type activities on the computers next year. Mm -hmm. Well, and how excited. <laughs> oh, I bet. And um, what are some of the, um, or like how do you think the MacBooks will affect learning here? Because I know that paper and pencil has been done for a long time. How do you think that the classroom will adjust? I think they'll adjust great. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some glitches getting everybody on Wi-Fi and mm -hmm. keeping them from getting kicked off the computers. But the kids this age are so good with technology and so mm -hmm. good with using different uh, resources and things like that online that I think we're going to be able to expand a lot of what we do. It'll be a lot more research-based, especially in a history classroom. I won't necessarily have to be the storyteller all the time anymore. They'll be able to have resources at their fingertips and they can kind of investigate and find some of that information on their own. And then we can elaborate and expand on different parts of the story as they do that research. Yeah, the MacBooks are definitely a, a good feature overall. But um, how do you think that these MacBooks will like, um, how do you think that the junior high will do like over time? Do you think that it'll get better, or how do you think that it'll play out throughout the years, more looking toward the future? Uh, I think I think education in the classroom is going to be a lot better with technology and with the MacBooks. I mean, the kids are really excited about it. I've never seen kids get particularly excited about a textbook. So yeah. this is really exciting that they're going to have all the information that they would ever need in a book right in their own personal MacBook. They can personalize it. They can get cases. So I think as far as the future goes, it's going to make learning for them a lot more enjoyable, a lot more exciting. Oh yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to no problem. come out. No problem. <laughs> Hello, and again, I am Cooper Hanson, and I'm here with Miss San Giorgio. Uh, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well myself. Okay. And uh, how do you prepare uh, the junior hires here for high school? Like, what are some of the main pan points that you focus on to get students here prepared for junior or high school? <laughs> um, well, um, in eighth grade, you know, they're making that transition, especially near the end of the year. So we do a lot of, um, you know, rigorous activities just to get mm -hmm. them geared up for high school. Um, you know, we kind of put a lot of responsibility on them. We kind of tend to lay off kind of helping them with as much and making them a little more independent um, to prepare them for high school. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, obviously the junior high is getting MacBooks next year. What technology are you using now? Well, we're very fortunate um, as English teachers because we have a one-to-one -one lab in our room. Mm -hmm. So, we have been using a lot of technology. Um, so, already we're implementing so much. Um, we use a lot of Classroom, Google Classroom to prepare them and they use that a lot in high school. So, mm -hmm. you know, even if they have one class where they have one-on-one -on -one technology, at least now they're ready in high school, and we as teachers are definitely prepared um, to begin using technology um, as far as just so many resources. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, like I said, you're getting MacBooks next year. Um, how do you think that the MacBooks will affect learning? Um, I think positively. I'm really, really excited to be able to mm -hmm. just, um, you know, use projects and so many things that resources that we can start implementing um, with the MacBooks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think will be, um, like obviously it'll take some time to get through it, but in the future, like looking toward the future, how do you think that the MacBooks will affect the school system as a whole in the long run? Um, in the long run, I think that uh, students will get more <laughs> used to using these MacBooks mm -hmm. and um, being like a technological community in the future, then they'll be well prepared citizens and they're going to be able to mm -hmm. use um, you know, just be proficient in like coding and all of these crazy careers mm -hmm. that are starting to pop up, especially using technology. So we're just going to be leaps and bounds um, ahead, I think, in, you know, society, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely the MacBooks will be a great addition to the junior high, I believe. And um, yeah, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your day to uh, come in for an interview. Thanks. Hi, I'm Matthew Haggard. Do you know what the acronym USAR stands for? Well, I'm here with my mom, Beth Haggard, and she'll tell us exactly what it is. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Very good. Okay, what does USAR mean? USAR stands for Urban Search and Rescue. What do Urban Search and Rescue teams do? We go into disaster areas and we will help the victims in whatever way. We are designed to do search and rescue and collapse structures. How many USAR teams are there in the United States? There are currently 27, and we're in the process of adding another team, so we will be soon be at 28. Where's the other team going to be added to? New Mexico. So, yeah, not every state has a team. Some states have more than one. Does Indiana have a team? Yes, we do. What's the name of Indiana's team? Um, we are called Indiana Task Force One. So there are so many teams in um, the United States. Who manages all those? Um, we fall in under the federal government and under the um, branch of FEMA. What is, uh, what is FEMA and what does it stand for? FEMA stands for Federal Emergency Management Agency and what they do is they make sure that disaster hit areas uh, get the aid and the equipment that they need and so that's when they decide when we go out if there is a need for us or a potential need. So in the task force, there's many parts to it to make, to make it all together. What are the different divisions in it? So Indiana Task Force One has 201 deployable members. So we are a very large team, but we don't go out with everybody. Under that heading, we have different divisions. So we have um, task force leaders. We have com comms or communications. We have logistics or we call them logs. They make sure that we get all the equipment we need, whether we come with it or they need to procure it. We have hazmat, um, rescue. There is search, and under search there is canine uh, and tech search. We have medical, and that is the division that I'm in. And um, I think that is in plans. In plans? Yep. So your job is medical. And you're a manager, right? Yes. What's, uh, <coughs> what's the expectations for a manager versus a regular team member? So in medical, we can either have medics, paramedics, um, nurses, physician assistants, and doctors. Um, currently, we have medics, nurses, and doctors, and we're all called medical specialists. So if needed, we will climb into collapse structures and take care of victims for the entire length of the time that they're trapped till we can get them out. 
Um, technically, the doctors, because they're the highest medical authority, are the team managers, but they're too busy on a daily basis to run the team. So I am not just a medical specialist, but I'm a medical team coordinator. So I handle the daily, I'm one of two, that handles the daily running of the team. So my job is to communicate between our um, our leaders for the team and our team members and make sure that everybody gets the information that they need as well as taking care of the training. When did you join the task force? I joined in the summer of 2005. Why did you want to join? Um, you know what, I, I'm a firefighter paramedic as a career and for me that just was something that allowed me to challenge myself on a higher level and be able to take m what I can do on a daily basis and step it up, but do it in an environment that is constantly on the flow. So um, it challenges me physically, professionally, mentally, um, emotionally. So that's why I wanted to do it. Okay, what, what kind of deployments does the team go on? The team will go on any, any type of disaster, whether it's man-made or it is a natural disaster. So we've been on both as a team. How often do you go on deployments? Um, you know, we go on deployments roughly every two to three years because we have the 27, almost 28 teams. There is a national rotation model, so that one team isn't always going out. Um, so when a disaster hits an area and there is a USAR team in that area, they are pulled out of the national rotation model and they are held as a state asset. That moves people up. Then they also will move the two closest teams in and then they move to the national rotation model. So, you know, it really kind of depends on where the disaster hits, but generally we go out every two to three years. How, no, so ev no, not everybody goes out. How do you determine who goes out? Within the team. Um, right, no, we can't take all 201 members. So generally we go out with 80 members at a time and we have to have a certain mem number of members in each division. And the number of people that we take in each division is set by FEMA. So with medical, we will go out with a heavy task force and the 80 plus member team. We will go out with two docs and four medics. And each division sets their, sets their own roster and everybody does it differently from medical. We just, for the people who are deployable, we just have a rotation every month. So it just kind of depends on who happens to be on the rotation when the disaster hits. <clears throat> what are some of the deployments the team has been on? The team, my team has been on 9-11, was um, probably one of the most memorable, Katrina. We were on Gustav and Ike, as well as Hurricane Sandy, and locally some flooding and tornadoes. What are some deployments you've been on? I have been in Jacksonville, Florida for a week. Um, the longest one was 21 days in Texas for Gustav and Ike, and then we were out for about 10 days in Sandy in New York. You've been on a few natural disasters. What's the most memorable? You know what, the most, there, it probably goes between Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Ike. Sandy um, really became a no-notice event for us because we were at the bottom of the rotation model and we weren't supposed to be deployed, but because we were the second closest state to the disaster area, um, we ended up going. So basically, I had a few hours to prepare. Um, really had not much time to call you guys and tell you that I was leaving. You guys had no idea. So that had me leaving and not having much prep time. Um, versus Ike, which started out as Hurricane Gustav and then rolled into Ike, that ended up becoming USAR's longest deployment in the history of USAR um, because they, at that point they could only have us up to two weeks and we were there for 21 days, um, but we were committed for 30 because it started as one hurricane and rolled into another. So just the length of time for Ike made it difficult for us and you know my family. So you went to Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Mm -hmm. What did you do on the deployment? We did a lot of walking. <laughs> so I, because there were no collapse structures, we didn't have to search for victims. We basically walked Long Island 
every day for about 12 hours. So we ended up walking anywhere from eight to 10 miles every day for days and days. Where did you sleep on when you were at Sandy? You know what, when we were at Sandy, we slept in, um, we slept in a gym um, and on cots, which was a nice change versus when we were at Ike and we slept wherever we could find. Sometimes at Ike, we slept on the bus Sometimes we were just on a sleeping bag on the floor of a convention center, um, maybe in a military institution. So we really just sleep wherever we can. So on that deployment, you kind of moved around. You didn't stay in that gym the whole time, right? Right, you no. I mean, both deployments, we were all over the place. The thing with FEMA and USAR is being fluid and flexible because we might start out on a mission and then we get immediately changed. So we have to be very, very flexible. What is a day like for you while you're on deployment? It starts very early, early from medical. We have to get up ahead of everybody else because we have to do medical check-ins and then grab a quick bite to eat. Um, my job, our medical, is to take care of our team first and foremost to keep us deployable and for, keep them safe from injuries and illnesses. And then we take care of victims. So we take care of everybody's injuries, scrapes, not feeling real well and then our day lasts longer than everybody else. They, everybody else goes to bed and we're doing paperwork and checking in on people. So we have kind of long days. So how long do deployments last at a time? Uh, you know, they can have us up to, it used to be two weeks, but after Ike, they decided, hey, we can just take them for three weeks because it worked then, so we'll just keep that going. So they can have us up to three weeks. So we have to be able to take everything that we can and compact it so that we don't take very much individually. Um, but as a team, we have enough to keep us sufficient uh, to take care of ourselves for 21 days without putting a stress on the system, which is already stressed. So when we leave, we might be gone for three weeks and not even know if we can talk to our family at any given time. Mm -hmm. How long do you have before you have to get at headquarters once you're called? So once we're called, uh, again, if we kind of have a heads up, we, um, we will have plenty of time to get there. But if we're a no notice event like 9-11 was, FEMA says we have four hours to get to headquarters before we're wheels up and on the road. Um, our team says we want to make it two hours so that we can get out ahead of FEMA requirements. So two hours from notification, we have to be able to have our stuff packed, which we have packed at all times. And you know, as you've seen my closet full of equipment. And we have to be able to have all of our prescription medicine and head to headquarters, which for me is almost an hour drive. So that gives me one hour to get all my stuff together, say goodbye to you and family, and then be gone. How, how many females are on the team? You know, out of the 201 mem members, we have roughly 20 females, so about 10%. When I started, there were about three females. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. No problem. Hi, I'm here today with Jeremiah Schroeder, the Parks and Recreation Director of Greenfield. How are you today? I'm just fine. That's good. So what does a Parks and Recreation Director do? Well, my particular job, like you said, I'm a Parks and Recreation Programs Director, so I manage all of the recreation programs that the City of Greenfield does for ages, basically everyone under the age of 55, and then some 55 and over programs. That sounds fun. Uh, what are some of the different projects that you do around Greenfield? Well, I help manage the pool during the summer. We run our uh, summer day camp. It's a popular program that we do. We also do many different nature programs at uh, like say Beckenholt Park and then we're getting ready to open up a nature preserve here, I'd say probably in the, the coming summer or fall. So we do, uh, we're gonna start some programming out there. Uh, we do a preschool uh, program. I'd say we have up to like 100 individual programs. So it keeps us, keeps us busy. That does sound very busy indeed. Yeah. Um, so what is one of your favorite or least favorite projects that you've had to do? Well, one of my favorite would be probably the summer day camp because when I came and uh, to work for Greenfield in 2005, 
it's neat to see now that many of the staff that we hire are students from Greenfield Central and they were kids when they were six years old and they went through the camp until they were 12 and now they're applying for positions to work there. So I think that's really, really neat to see. Uh, in fact, one of our student or our, one of our directors that manages the program, she was, I remember being a six year old, but now she's a college student engaged to be married. Uh, so you really enjoy that aspect of it. As far as the least, uh, there aren't too many bad aspects uh, with anything. You can't make everybody happy all the time with the choices that you make. So, you know, nobody really enjoys the the angry customer. But <laughs> you get a, you know you do the best that you can. Oh yeah, I know how an angry customer is. Right. I'm a cashier. Right. It's not fun. Um, so what do you do to kind of help keep the city clean? Well, we actually have a maintenance crew that works for the uh, Greenfield Parks and Recreation. And part of their daily duties are to inspect the parks for, uh, and, and basically policing debris. And then if an individual program ha you know, uses a facility or an outdoor space, they're responsible for that as well. So we even have one of our nighttime uh, or our evening facility supervisors every day that he comes in. For instance, at Riley Park, he goes around and picks up all the trash. Uh, it's important to us to be kind of a leader in the community in keeping uh, parks clean and then on our parks website I know there's a, a page about educating the public on littering because it can affect you know things that get into the sewer lines affect may possibly the water quality uh, things of that nature I actually read that and it was very interesting right. and um, so what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions about the parks and recreation department well, when I started entering in the field, everyone thinks you're a park ranger or you're a gym teacher or you just go around and kick a ball out in the yard. Uh, but it's, there's a lot more business to it than I thought. Uh, it's, you know, because I graduated from Indiana University and they, everyone knows about the Kelly School of Business, so you just think that you're going to do that. You're going to do, you know, the accounting and things like that. And there are a lot of those aspects in what I do. Now, do I get to go out? and interact with the kids or interact with the you know adult program, sure I do. But I would say that, uh, like for the instance, I have to wear khakis and a, and a polo shirt, but you know, I was thinking, you know, a lot of times people would think you're gonna wear, you know, high tops and a t-shirt and shorts, and you're just gonna go out there and kick the ball around and shoot it around, so. All right, and um, what is one of the hardest or the easiest projects you've had to do? Hardest, I, I took over the management of the pool about two two three summers ago and it was a, a good operation it's just that the pool has been around since i believe like 1980 so it's been difficult just trying to make sure that everything is well maintained and getting it up to date make sure we're ada compliant uh, just a lot of details now it's been fun but just a lot of details that we've had uh, that would be i say one of the bigger challenges that we faced all right and what would you say what project would you say took some of the most time to complete as I mentioned, like the pool, and then when I first came, just really uh, an overall orientation into what programs that we had and how they operate, and getting to know the community. Because I've worked in, you know, Bloomington, I've worked in South Florida, uh, the Florida Keys, and different places like that. So, a real challenge is to properly educate yourself on the public and kind of their wants and needs. All right, and do you think the people of Greenfield like notice? anything you get like small stuff that you guys do i would say overall yes uh there are you know and with anything with any industry or business you know pe they're going to be people that don't you know know about it but we have facebook we have twitter we have a website uh, and different avenues you know newsletters that we send out that we inform the public there's a park board meeting that's open to the public every month at city hall and uh, our superintendents on a, a number of different committees in the community so we really try to get ourselves out there like with our internal operations and also external. All right, yeah, that's, I mean, got to get out there, let people know. Right. And um, what do you, what is it like when you see like a long kind of difficult project completed? It's gratifying um, and it's, the best part of that is getting to see the residents of Greenfield get to enjoy it. Like Beckenholt Park, for instance, the grand opening was in 2009, and that took many years to, you know, with the whole staff working on that. And the grand opening uh, day was, was really neat to see that. So I would just say that's probably the best thing is when you get to see the actual users and 
participants enjoy you know the, the program or the facility all right and is there like a project that you have an idea you want to do but it just hasn't happened yet uh, we're working on a, a possible full day preschool option currently we have a half day option but we're looking at where else can we meet a need for that early childhood education market and we're looking at doing something like say from eight to four uh, instead of just like the half day that we've got now to help working parents so we're just we're now compiling an interest list are there any uh, old projects that you guys have done that you think maybe need some maintenance or some more work on them i think you always do that like i think on a yearly evaluation basis you look at you know, some will say you should eliminate 10% of your programming and add 10%. Uh, we really try to do a good evaluation process to see what's effective, and we do that throughout the year. So we do touch-ups and clean-ups with about everything that we do. Uh, for instance, we discontinued like an actual hard copy of our park program guide because technology is really taking over. So now we have an online version. It's good for the environment, and then it actually helps us communicate to a lot more users that use that are internet and you know tech savvy oh yeah everybody nowadays has got to be on your phone or tablet right. or computer and um so how many projects would you say you guys complete a year well it depends on like we do our park superintendent has an, an actual project list and she has program due dates so it really just depends on the year and it depends on the season so uh, we like I said, I work with like a hundred individual programs in a year. Now there are, you know, within those, there's like an overall component, like say art and gymnastics, but within those programs, there are, there are a lot of uh, different individual programs. We are working on putting, or we just finished putting like fitness, outdoor fitness equipment. That's a new uh, trend, I guess I would say, in parks and recreation to where people can just go on the Pensy Trail and there are like, I believe, two pieces of outdoor fitness equipment. And I'd like to see us do things like that, that we, you know, can, can expand upon. And then we're always just maintaining, say, tennis courts, basketball courts with surfacing nets, uh, things of that nature, and just, modern, you know, different repairs. All right, and one last thing before we go. Um, do you have any big projects planned for the coming years? or? We're looking at, uh, like I said, Thornwood Preserve. It's not open to the public right now, but it'll be one of the only nature preserves around the areas. Herb and Judy Brown, it was their family that owned the property, and they donated it to Greenfield Parks and Recreation and wanted it to be preserved forever. So we are in the process. Uh, we put a, bri a concrete bridge in, getting a parking lot and signage. We have a park naturalist that's looking forward to leaving many different types of programs like pond life, tree identification, plant, evasive plants, uh, programming, and just we do in different family programs that families can do all at once. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in today.